Come on, can you just declare that all you want is Jesus? Come on. you enter into the sanctuary just put your eyes on heaven and just declare all I want want come on say it with your heart surrender to your power we surrender to your authority all I want is you all I want is you all I want is you come on if you want them Come on, reach up and grab him. If you want him, reach out and touch him. Come on, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Anybody came to brush the name of Jesus in the place? Come on, did somebody come to praise the name of Jesus? Let's go, let's go.
Hallelujah is the highest praise. We bless you, Lord. God, you're worthy. And no one else. Compares to you.
my worship, receive my worship, all of my worship, here's my worship, all of my Here's my worship, all of my worship. I got a question for you guys. When the woman broke the perfume on the feet of Jesus, everyone knew what she had broken open. It was an alabaster box. And the beautiful thing that I want to show you and pull out on the alabaster box is what was in the alabaster box. It was precious perfume. So as we go up in this one minute and 50, 15 seconds, my question is, what does your worship smell like? When you break open your box, of alabaster what does it smell like in the place can can you just begin to open up your box of alabaster to the king begin to pour on your worship he wants to hear from you on today he doesn't want to hear from us oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. come on come on people of god come on come on He'll fix that problem if you let it. He'll change that situation around. He'll change that diagnosis around. an altar right where you stand everybody's standing we're gonna make an altar right where you stand when we tell God here is my worship let it be a sweet smelling savor in your nostrils I'm gonna choose to burn up my thinking choose to burn up the lifestyle that is not pleasing to God I choose to burn up anything that's not like him here is my worship, God. Here's my worship, God. Hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus. No one can worship for you. No one can tell God who he's been to you but you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let our worship be sweet to you, God. Here I am, Jesus. Jesus. Here I am, Jesus. Oh, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. Nobody else like you, Jesus. Nobody else like you, Jesus. You're the lifter of my head. Hallelujah. You You are, you are, you are, you are. 
I won't be silent. I choose not to be silent. I'll always, always, no matter what's going on, I choose to always worship you. Woo! As long as there's breath in my body, God. Hallelujah, I will worship you, God. I will worship you, Jesus. and seen, God, that you are good. Woo. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Anybody testify that his mercy has endured forever? His mercy. Woo. That means I was guilty of something, but his mercy endured forever. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. We'll get morning impact. Good morning, good morning. If impact is in the building, I need you to make a shout like you know who Jesus is. No, I can't tell that you know who Jesus is. I said if impact is in the building, let me know that you know who the King of Kings is and the Lord of Lords is. Like he woke you up this morning and he started you on your way. I can't tell that impact is in the building. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, Impact. I'm so glad I rose to my feet to welcome you to the Impact Church of Nashville. They understood. Welcome you to the Impact Church of Nashville. Amen. 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 Do we have any first-time worshipers with us today? Wave at me. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are so thankful that you chose to worship here at the Impact Church of Nashville just with us. We want to make you feel so welcome that you never want to not be here in Jesus' name. Y'all help me welcome our online audience, everybody who's watching from all over the world. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for choosing to click on and worship with us. So Impact, we're going to do what we do. Stand up on your feet. Go to somebody else. Give them a high five, a fist bump, or a hug and tell them welcome. I'm so glad to see you. Welcome to 
are so thankful for all of our first time worshipers. We have a QR code on the screen for you. If you just take out your phones and point your screen, your, your phone to the screen, uh, this code will take you to a survey where you can drop in just a few bits of information. We simply want to just stay connected to you. Amen? Amen. We love to pray for one another. We love to serve you in any capacity. So we simply want to stay connected. We won't hound you down or chase you or call you too much. But we just want to say, how you doing and do you need anything? Amen? Amen. For all of our first-time guests, uh, at, right after service, we have a reception created just for you. If you go through these main doors and to the right into our VIP room, we have light refreshments prepared. We want to greet you, meet you, know your name. This is where you get a chance to meet Pastor Faison, some of the leadership of the house. If you have questions, if you've been wondering what is impact all about or what are they doing, that's a great place for you to come and get those questions answered. Amen. Amen. On social media, y'all, we want to stay connected to you. You can follow us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube at all of the handles that you will see on the screen anytime now. Hey, out oh, there we go. <laughs> we want to simply stay connected. We know that's our new way of staying connected and communi sending out communications quickly to big groups of people. So make sure that you're plugged in in those spaces. Amen. Just a few announcements. We still are partnering with our um, the International Leadership Summit with Bishop T.D. Jakes. We, it's coming up March 21st to the 23rd in Dallas, Texas. They're running a special buy one registration and get the second half off. So if you've been thinking and praying and wondering, can you go, should you go, maybe this is the answer for you. Make sure you see one of us in leadership and we'll make sure to get you the information for you to register, amen? We still have care packages for anyone who is in need, for all of our folks in the Goodlessville, greater Nashville community, anybody in need, if, they're, if, if they need coats and gloves and hats, if they need water and food and some other things like that, make sure you see us. We'll be glad to serve them. And our last announcement, we have our leadership meeting this month. So all of my leaders here, we will be meeting Saturday, January 20th at 10 a.m. Make sure you have it on your calendar. We took some time off of the holidays, but we are back. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, that, I think that's it. Everybody go ahead and stand up on your feet for me. We're getting ready to welcome back Pastor Faison. He took some time off so he could be with his family. But aren't y'all glad that he's back? Come on, aren't y'all glad? Come on, give God a praise in this house. Woo! I said give God a praise in this house. Hallelujah! This is the first Sunday in 2024. You ought to give God a praise in this place. Y'all yeah! can do better than that. I said you ought to give God a crazy praise in this place. Come on, let the devil know who's side. Everything that had me held up, tied up, held down, bound up, I'm shaking it off right now. Would you look at somebody and say, shake it off? Yeah, shake it off. Shake it off. Don't let no attitude follow you into this new year. Don't let no bad moods or bad spirits follow you into this new year. Don't let no hateful looks bind you up in this new year. Would you give God? I'm not superstitious or nothing like that. But my mother used to say that whatever you was doing in the first Sunday or the first week of the year, that's what you'd be doing all year long. I just want to let the devil know I came into this year with the praise. I'm going to start. You can expect this all year. If you expect your mouth to be closed, then shut your mouth. But everybody that expects to give God a praise all year long, open your mouth and give him a shout right
ain't gonna fool with you. Be seated for a moment. Be seated for just a moment. I want to, I want to seize this opportunity to acknowledge one of our members, Sister Stephanie Waters. Uh, her grandmother passed on last week, and we want to be holding that family up in prayer uh, as they prepare to funeralize her on tomorrow. This is a church that knows how to rally, how to get behind people, and our church is committed to assisting them and helping them and supporting them. Sister Stephanie, stand up so they know who you are. Sometimes people come in and out, yeah, people come in and out of your midst, and you don't know who they are or what they're dealing with, but I just want to take this moment right here to offer a word of prayer for her and her family. Would you all stand up? Stand up right there. Just point your hands at them. Amen? Amen. For many people, coming through the holidays is a time of celebration and, and parties, but sometimes tragic things happen, unexpected things happen, things that occur, not just them, but all over this room. There are things that we have had to deal with and contend with through the holidays. And I just want you to just take a moment, just point your hands at them. Father, I thank you for this family, for this moment, Lord. We, we embrace them as a family of God and hold them up in words of prayer. And ask God that you give them peace and comfort like only you can. None of us, Lord, want to lose someone that we love. We understand, Lord, that all of none of us are here to stay. Lord, we have memories. We have love. We have opportunities to love people. But I pray, God, that as this family goes through this tragic moment, that you would comfort Sister Stephanie and her entire family, the people, the ones we know, the ones we don't know, and that you, God, would help us to show the love of God. Lift them, Lord, when their heads are bowed. Be with them when no one else could even understand. Catch their tears, because you know what every tear knows means in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God praise for them. Would you just reach over and touch somebody and let them know, I'm praying for you. 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 Sometimes, sometimes it's just nice to know that somebody's praying for you and not praying on you. Y'all not going to talk to me. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes when people say they're praying for you, they're really praying against you. Yeah, they give you that nice church smile. I'm praying for you, but they really want something tragic to happen for you. But if you mean it, if you really mean it, look at somebody around you, just touch them and say, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that you receive a life of prosperity and healing and health and wellness and blessings and favor that everything the devil tried to do won't work. Y'all not going to talk to me on this morning. Y'all y'all kind of quiet. It's too quiet to be 2024. Y'all act like y'all stuck in 2023. I said it's too quiet to be 2024. I'm happy to be back in the house. I'm glad to be back in Nashville. My wife sends her love and regard. She's watching us online. Let's give God praise for First Lady Tanya Faison. Yeah, it was hard to tear me away, but I'm on assignment. How many know I'm on assignment? Yeah, this, this is the part of the field that God has sent us to do the work. And so we gladly and we honestly and we respectfully take on this role. There's a number of things I want to do on today before we get to the word of God. I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 8. I just want to share this brief scripture with you. It's offering time in the sanctuary. And yeah, and so as we take this first offering in 2024, the Lord was ministering to me about this particular scripture, and I just want to share it with you. And hopefully uh, it resonates with you and helps you understand the assignment that God has given to each of us, that this is something that God wants to resonate with us. Exodus chapter 25, I'm just going to parse it, I'm not going to go through all of it, I just want to just get this in your spirit. God had just brought Israel out of Egyptian bondage, they were coming through the wilderness and God was preparing them to show them how he wants to be approached and how he wants to be respected. And so he says this to Moses, verse 25, chapter 25, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to get this, bring me an offering. Underscore the word me. God was making it clear that this offering is not for Moses. This is for me. 
this offering is not so that Moses can get a, a, a new tent, a new camel, some new gear. This is not to glamorize or to fill up Moses' life with all the things that he could have, but this was about me. Somebody say me. This did not start with Moses. This was something that was required by God himself. He said, bring me a what? Y'all saying like y'all scared. God said, bring me a what? Offering. Bring me an offering. And Moses, you are to receive the offering for me. That means that Moses' job was to stand in the stead of God and receive it on God's behalf. Now, this just kills all those people who always talk about all preachers do is beg for money. All they do is stand up and beg and beg and beg. But in truth, reality, the preacher, the pastor, Moses, was sent to be a representative of God to receive an offering for who? Y'all ain't paying attention this morning. Y'all got to wake up. He was called to receive an offering, but it wasn't for him. It was for who? God. For God. So his responsibility was to stand up and to ask the people to receive from their gifts, not for him, but for who? God. I want to get that in your spirit because many times because of the abuses that happen in church when it comes to money and offering and gifts, people are funny about giving. And every time it's time for offering, we get real tight. I'm not giving my money to no man. I'm not giving my money to him. He don't need it. He don't want it. But be clear that this was something that didn't start with Moses. This was something that started with God. You're reading it for yourself. He said, receive the offering for me from everybody whose heart prompts them to give. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So now we've impaired it down to everybody who wants to. Everybody who's, one place says, whose heart burned in them to give. The fact that he said that for those who want to means that there are some people who don't want to. My suspicion is that the people of God are not suffering from lack of resources. The people of God are suffering because of stinginess. I shouldn't hit him that hard the first Sunday. I'm just stealing somebody's joy. It is a heart issue. You don't see where Moses is begging. You don't see where Moses is promising them blessed glasses of water. You don't see where Moses is exchanging gifts. If you give me an offering, then I'll give you a blessed cloth or give you a blessed glass of water or I'll, I'll give you some special gifts. This was just a God who made an appeal through a vessel and said, bring an offering to me. And everybody whose heart stirred in them gave it willingly. The offering time is not supposed to feel like an auction. It's not supposed to feel like we're pulling something out of you that you don't want to do. The moment they found out what God wanted, they did it willingly. That there are some people that when it comes to the offering, their hearts get stirred. There are some people who can't wait for the offering time. Yeah, let's get past the singing. Let's get past the shouting. I got some money jumping in my pocket that I can't wait to give to God. <laughs> there are some people that when it comes to the offering, it's not a pull and a tug and a back and forth. But I give to God because he has first given to me. Oh, I'm going to get into it some more. Listen, this is what God said, verse 3. These are the offerings you are to receive from me. And I don't want to go down through all these things. But these are the things that God asked to give. The gold, silver, bronze, blue and purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, olive oil, fragrance oils, onyx stones, precious gems. All these things he asked for from the people. Now, this is what bothered me a little bit, because I was asking myself, well, where'd they get all this? He was asking people to give me something. And I'm asking, you're in the wilderness, God. Where did they get this? They didn't get it from the wilderness. They got it from Egypt. Y'all not woke this morning. Y'all 
They, 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 there wasn't no gold and silver and bronze and ram skins and precious gems in the wilderness. That means when they came out of Egypt, yeah, fix my sound. I know the devil don't want this said. That means when they came out of Egypt, they didn't come out broke. They didn't get these gems from the wilderness. They got them from their secular occupation and they brought what was in the world's hands and they brought it to the church. Y'all, are y'all hearing me up in here? That means that everything, oh God, that means that everything that God needs is already in the room. It's already in the room or it's coming. That means we don't have to resort to gimmicks. We ain't got to resort to cons. We ain't got to check people's tax returns and find out what they made last year to determine what your tithes ought to be. That means that everything that God, don't be fooled by what people are wearing. God got some rich people in here. Y'all not going to talk to me. Don't be fooled by what I drive and where I live and what I wear. God, where are my wealthy people at in here? Where are my blessed people at in here? See, sometimes when it comes to the offering, we're intimidated to ask because we assume everybody is broke. But all of God's people ain't broke. All the rich people here, identify yourself. We ain't going to ask you for nothing. Just identify yourself. I'm a wealthy. You, you, listen, look at somebody and testify. I'm a wealthy man. I'm a wealthy woman. I'm a blessed man. I'm a blessed woman. I'm not going to come in here and hang my head down looking for a handout at help. I came to give help. Would somebody that came to give help jump on your feet and say, I came to give You ain't jumping up. You act like you at a movie somewhere. I said, jump on your feet and said, I came to give help. Gone are the days when I have to give a handout, get a handout. God said, you're going to be the head. Right, sit down because I wasn't even there yet. Verse 8. This is where I want you to go. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. Uh -huh. So we read all this. God saying take an offering, but God never said what the offering was for. He just said take an offering. The problem with many people is every time it's offering time, Connie, they start thinking, well, what you need the offering for? <laughs> yeah. You want to know, what, what's the offering for? you raising money, Pastor. What's the money for? But there were at least eight verses where God said to give it. God said what to give, and he never said what it was for. The people responded to the leadership. The people responded to the request of God without knowing what the money was for. Uh, I'm breaking curses today. I'm trying to mess with people's minds today. They just gave it because they had a willing heart to do it. Then, verse 9, God reveals why I want you to give. So that I may have a sanctuary. <laughs> a dwelling place. I want a place in the middle of the desert that becomes an opportunity for my people to come to worship, to get instruction, to get direction, to get teaching. I want you to build a sanctuary, not for you, to build a place for me to dwell in. Am I teaching this morning or not? I want you to put your collective resources together. I want you to build a place where people can come and have an encounter with me. Not an encounter with you. The problem with the church is that we think that the church is a stage for us. It is not a stage for you. It is not a stage for you to flaunt your gifts and your talents and your abilities. It is not the place where you can show off your new outfit and how well you sing and how well you preach and how well you teach. No. The sanctuary is built so that people can have an encounter with God. To have a place where God would sit down in the midst of them. Now, now let, let me say, somebody said, well, what good is having God in the midst of us? I'm glad you asked. 
Having God in the midst of them meant that every time they needed something to eat, God provided food for them every day. Every day he provided something called manna, which was bread from heaven, so that in the wilderness where there were no shopping malls, there were no grocery stores, God provided food every day. And when they needed flesh, God provided quail in the middle of the desert. And when they got thirsty, God provided water for them out of a rock. Not a brook, not a river, not a stream. God had a rock that gushed out water to satisfy their thirst. And how good was that rock? The rock followed them all the way around the wilderness. What am I saying? That having God in the midst of you means that every need will be met. That whatever I need from God, he's already made provision for it. You keep wanting to have famous folks in your midst, but what you should be looking for is to have God in your midst. And if you get God in your midst, everything else you need, God will provide it. Oh, my God. Somebody lift your hands right here and begin to worship. This is why we have this worship team here. This is why we have this band here, because we're trying to create an atmosphere where God can sit in the midst of his people. And if God sit down in your house, you'll have the money you need. You'll have the resources you need. Y'all not happy about this. We got it backwards. We got it backwards, Leah. And maybe that's why we're not as blessed as we should be. We keep trying to create a place for famous folk. Turn me down some. We keep trying to create a platform for famous people. I want to know who's singing, who's famous singing, who's famous preaching. And we got it backwards. What we should be creating is an atmosphere where we can get God in the midst of us. I want you to take a moment right here and begin to lift your hands and begin to worship. Because the Bible said that when we begin to worship, that God inhabits the praises of his people. That when we begin to worship God, it literally means that he is enthroned. That he sits down in the midst of his people. Everything that you're worried about right now, you don't need connections. You don't need friends. You don't need opportunity. You don't need nobody to back you up. What you need is God. If I can get God in my midst, I can get everything I need. You're not worshiping. Come on, come on, come on. Create an atmosphere that's so strong that God comes in this place. That healing goes forth in this place. Do you not know? That even in disobedience, even in disobedience, when they walked in the wilderness for 40 years, that their shoes didn't wear out, that nobody died from sickness, but everybody died of natural causes. And somebody said, what good is having God in your midst? Having God in your midst means I can have everything I need. So for 30 seconds, I want you to open your mouth and begin to worship God until the presence of God comes in here. I need everything worshiping. 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 I need everything opening your mouth. I need everything creating an atmosphere. Come on, Jesus. Come on in our midst. Come on in our midst. Before I ask you for anything, I just need you.
I hear God saying, you take care of my business, I'll take care of your business. You don't hear me in here. You take care of my kids, I'll take care of your kids. You make sure my house has what it needs, I'll make sure your house has what it needs. That's it. This is the atmosphere that God wants to receive an offering in an atmosphere of praise because the Bible said that God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a hilarious giver. Not somebody mad, not somebody got an attitude, not somebody that's fussing and complaining, not somebody saying why they got to take an offering. I need my cheerful people to jump on your feet and give God a cheerful praise. Where you at? 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 I just told you, if you create an atmosphere for God, God will bless you with what you need. You ought to be leaping by now. You ought to be running by now. You ought to be yelling by now. You ought to be rejoicing by now. So, so, so I read all that. It's a little bit lengthy, but I read all that, and I explained, keep on standing, keep on standing. I explained all that because I wanted you to understand the atmosphere and the attitude that we're going to be going into this year in regards to our giving. I wanted to make sure that you understood that there is a method behind our madness. I want you to understood clearly in your ear that God wants you to know that if you take care of his business that God will take care of your business don't ask me about taking care of your kids when God has children that have need and you ignore it I gotta make it plain don't ask me about making a house for you or buying a house for you if my house is not taken care of don't ask me about provision for your house while you ignore needs in my house and if you create a sanctuary for me, if you create a place of worship for me, if you make sure that this house is here to make a difference, God said, I will bless you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This community needs a church. It's not that they don't have other churches, but God needs this church, this particular ministry, the impact church in this community. And you may not realize it, but this community needs this house more than this house needs the community. Because truth be told, wherever there is a place of worship, God begins to not just bless the people in the house, but everything around the house. Are y'all paying attention to what's happening in this, in this community that right around you, that businesses are coming back to the Rivergate area? Uh, y'all don't put this stuff together y'all think it was a decision by the mayor or the city council but the truth be told wherever God plants a church he starts blessing everything around the church do y'all not see condos being built around here have y'all not noticed in the last six months that new apartments are built less than a mile from here have y'all noticed that other churches are moving to this community y'all don't hear me they're not moving to other places they're moving right here because this is the place somebody said this is the the place is it the place and God wants this church to be here to meet the needs in this city in this community and it's not coming out of heaven it's coming from his people you just read it when God asked for an offering he didn't go outside and get it he got it from the people in here that means that somebody here God's about to open your hands and bless you in ways that you can't imagine 
Oh, God. I must be talking to the wrong people. I must have hit a vein because you're quiet. That God's about to put you in position. Did you hear what I said? That God's about to put you in position. Don't get tight because you don't have it now. God said, I'm about to put you in position. Look at somebody and say, God's going to put me in position. So here's what I want. Here's what I want. All of you are preparing the tithe, stand up on your feet. All of you are preparing the tithe, stand up on your feet. All of you are preparing to give an offering, stand up on your feet as well. It's going to be QR codes on the screen on both sides of the stage. For our visitors, this is your first time here. You should have gotten an offering envelope as you entered into the sanctuary. That's so that you can participate in our giving. If you did not receive an offering envelope by chance, just lift your hand in the air. Here's a hand here. There's a hand there. Yeah, move quickly to them. Amen. Move quickly to them because they want to participate. I want to challenge you this year. I want to challenge you in this first offering of this brand new year. I want you to give some variation of 2024. If you can, I want those of you who can to give 2024. Somebody in here can do that. Don't get tight. I mean, you know if you got it or if you don't have it. But if somebody, I want to challenge you to give 2024. For somebody, I want you to give $200.24. Praise the Lord. For somebody, that's too steep. I want to give $24. But I want you to give some variation of 2024 because I want you to know, I want you to let God know I'm on, I'm on your side. I want to see this house go up. I want to see this ministry go up. How many people love this ministry? Yeah. I love this ministry. I want to see this ministry go forward and not have to struggle, not have to strain, not have to go into all sort of, sort of gicks, gimmicks and tricks and scams. I just, I just don't like to do it. I don't like to get into it. I believe in giving because it's in your heart to do it. I'm a funny sort of person. I don't want you to give me nothing if you don't want to. I don't. Don't give me a glass of water if you don't really want to. I'd rather just be dry and thirsty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, somebody give you something, they got to give it to you with an attitude. I don't want you to just keep it. But for everybody whose heart is stirred, I want you to participate in this. I want to take you a step further. If that's you, you're, you're sowing on top. This is on top of your giving. This is on top of your tithing. If you're doing that, would you just come and stand with me real quick? Just real quick. Don't even think about it. Just hurry up. If you're giving on top of what you were planning to give, I want you to come real quick. Just hurry up. Hurry up because I got to get to this word. I got a New Year's word. Hallelujah. I got a word. Somebody else. I'm giving on top of what I was giving. I prepared my tithes and offerings. We do that. But this is a new year, and I want to start the year. Amen? I want to start the year. I want this first offering to be so strong that we're not worrying about what we got to pay for for the next three or four months. Y'all not with me today. Yeah, y'all done been through Christmas and holidays and gift wrapping and all that, but I don't want you to forget about God. Come on, somebody else, somebody else. Somebody else, somebody else. I just want to, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Whatever you were going to give, just hurry up and come up here. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. God needs this church to survive. Not only that, God needs this church to thrive. So that as needs come up all year long, we can respond to those needs. That we can make sure that our bills are paid, that our staff is paid, and we still have things in our coffer so we can be a blessing. Somebody right now is going through issues with their family. Somebody needed a refrigerator. Somebody needed somebody's loved one to be buried. Somebody needs a scholarship for their kids. And God is making sure that he's going to bless this ministry through you. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. People support things that they love. I've never seen the liquor store out on the corner giving, begging for offerings. People that love liquor go to the liquor store. The dope man ain't worried about no money. People that's in the dope, they find the dope man. Where can I find the dope man? Because they pay for what they love. Where your heart is, there's your treasure. And this is where our heart is. And I want you to put your money where your heart is. My God, I feel I'm in the room. They're coming. They're coming. Come on up here, sis. Come on up. I got space all up here. I got space all on hide in the corner. Amen. We don't give to be seen, but we don't mind being seen giving. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody else. 
I've already got my tithes in. I've already got my offering in. But, but I plan on giving something on top of that. On top of that. Because I want to be sure that when I need something, that I've created a space for God to do something. You can't expect a harvest where there is no seed. How crazy is that to be standing over ground that you haven't put anything in and expecting a harvest? Put some offering envelopes in the hand of my praise team. Amen. Amen. Put them in the hands of my band. I want everybody in on this. I want everybody in on this. This is the first Sunday of a new year. We are setting a standard. We are setting a precedence. God is going to bless. I believe there are some millionaires going to come out of here this year. I'm not just talking. I believe that God is going to put you in position where you ain't got to worry about nothing. And everything you take care of for him, God's going to take care of for you. Somebody else needs to come. Somebody else. Lift those gifts up before the Lord. You that have come forward, lift those gifts up before the Lord. Because I believe that God is going to open up doors for you supernaturally. That because we didn't have to beg and pry and plod, but you came because your heart was stirred and you were willing, God said, you know, we're going to have to struggle. You're not going to have to worry about it. That right now, while you're lifting your gift up, that God is putting you on somebody's heart right now. I see him coming to you, giving you more than what you asked for. Somebody's been looking for a job at a certain dollar amount. God said, I'm going to exceed what you were asking for. You, you don't believe this. You don't believe this. You were looking for a house with a certain square footage. God said, I'm going to exceed that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Some of you have been praying over your kids to have scholarships. And God said, I'm going to have multiple opportunities come your way. Do you hear what I'm saying to you in here? Hallelujah. Your doctor's going to be surprised. Your doctor's going to be shocked because God said, I'm bringing down your blood sugar. I'm bringing down your blood pressure. I'm fixing things that the doctor couldn't fix. I'm healing things right now with an offering. Yes, with an offering. I'm going to heal. I'm going to deliver. You don't lift your hands right here. Hallelujah. Those of you who are out there who are participating, I want you to lift your gifts up also. If you're watching me online, I'm appealing to you that as you connect with this church and this ministry, that God is positioning us to do great things. Oh, I got to go. I got to go. Lord, have mercy. I got to go. Father, I lift up every person under the sound of my voice. Every person that's believed this word. Every person that loves your work and loves your ministry and loves your church. I'm praying, God, that you would open up doors for them that no man can shut. That you would make ways for them that no man can shut down. We're praying for supernatural favor, for doors of opportunity, that Lord, this be the last year, last year, what the last year I'll be broke and begging and worried and walking the floor worrying about money. Money is not going to be an issue for me from this day forward. I sow into this ground and I receive it. And because I know you for so a prayer answering God, I'm going to thank you for it now and let you do it later. Everybody that agree with that prayer Give God praise right here. Come on, give God praise right here. Hallelujah. I said, give God praise right here. He told Shatel of Osa. He can do all Shatel of Osa. He tell you all Shat. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. Real quickly, everybody that came to the altar to give, I want you to put your offering in my hand. I want to touch and agree with you today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It shall come. Come on. It will come to pass. If you got a phone, just tap your phone on here. In the name of Jesus. It will happen. It will happen. It will happen. I believe it. 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 Yes. Yes, you too. You too. In the name, lift your hand. Would you serve the people of God? Everybody else got an offering in your hand. I, hallelujah. Where my usher that They don't fell out. Lord have mercy. Do this for me. If you got an offering envelope, would you pass it down to your left? Pass it all the way down to your left. Pass it all the way down to your left. Yeah, it's my right, but it's your left. To the left. To the left. Amen. Come on, help me celebrate the Lord. 
Come on, let me celebrate the Lord. If you would just play softly for me. I want to seize this first Sunday of the year to lead this family into communion. I'm waiting for my praise team to get into position. Make sure they're served back there in the back. You should have gotten a communion element, a communion element as you came into the sanctuary this morning. If by chance you did not receive it, would you just lift your hands real quickly? I see hands going up. Ushers, would you serve them? Would you serve them quickly? I thought it would be apropos for us to take this first Sunday of this new year to participate in the communion ceremony as a family. Somebody said, well, Pastor, how come we don't have communion every Sunday or every first Sunday or every fourth Sunday like other churches do? And there's one simple answer for that. The Bible says as oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. It didn't say how often we should do it. It just says as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so we don't do it every Sunday. We don't do it every fourth Sunday, every first Sunday. We do it as God leads us because it's important to us that we don't do things out of routine. Every time you start doing something every Sunday or every first Sunday or every fourth Sunday, it becomes routine. And we start losing the significance of this important ritual. You see, the Apostle Paul had to straighten out issues in the early church in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I believe, where he started telling them that when you have communion, your, your motives are all wrong. You do it in a way that does not honor our Lord. That communion is not supposed to be a place for us to eat a cracker and drink some juice and have a party, but it's supposed to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made that the bread symbolizes his body that was beaten for us. That the wine symbolizes his blood that was shed for us. That's supposed, supposed to remind us of what sacrifice he made so that we could have salvation. And so Paul says that before a man or a woman partakes in the Lord's Supper, to let him first examine himself to see if he is in the faith. Examine yourself. This should be introspective. That this should be an opportunity before you partake of a cracker or a juice that is not just about formalities, it's not just ritual, that there should be an inward look. That you should pause for a moment to see if you've forgiven people. There's no good to take communion if you're going to go back to being hateful, disrespectful, being mean. I got one clap. This is why this is why the unbelievers don't respect the rituals of the church because they know it's just formality. They can come in smelling like reefer and smelling like alcohol and take communion and go right on back to drinking and smoking and lying and doing whatever because it doesn't mean anything to them. But the apostle Paul said I want you to pause right here before you take anything. Examine yourself. And see if you're in the faith. And for this reason, because people do not discern the body, because they don't respect the body, he said that for this reason, there are many who are sick among you. That you are dealing with diseases and ailments that you shouldn't even have to deal with is because you have not respected my body. For this reason, there are many of us who, God forbid, who have, who have passed away prematurely. That there are many who have passed away prematurely, not because they're bad people, but because we did not respect, discern the body of the Lord. So before you break that seal, my sister, before you break that seal, my brother, I'm going to give you a few seconds here to check your heart. Check your heart. Repent for sin. If you mad at somebody, let it go. Let it go. How dare you respect 
the sacrifice of our Lord, to step over what he has given up for you, to walk in here and take this communion element and still go back to being hateful, being mean. So you didn't get along with him, let it go. Let him go. To go back to living in sin, you should be uncomfortable. I talked about this last, I talked about this last year about how conviction has left the church. That God has not put, that, that many people are not convicted. It doesn't bother me that people make mistakes, that people have issues. It bothers me that it don't bother you. All of us make mistakes. All of us have issues. All of us have things we have to work on, but it should bother you. If you can walk past somebody without speaking to them, it should bother you. If you can be shacking up with somebody that's not your husband or your wife, it should bother you. If you can make, if you mess around with somebody's husband, somebody's wife, it should bother you. I'm not saying people are perfect. I'm just saying that conviction has to come back into the house of God. And so in this moment before you break that seal, if there's anything in you that needs to be forgiven or needs to be corrected or needs to be addressed, or needs to be addressed I want you to take a moment right here as you play softly and bow your heads and talk to the master. If you're watching me online, I want you to do the same thing. Even though we can't see you, God can see you. Let's start this new year fresh. Let's clean the slate. Let's let some stuff go. Somebody need to forgive a child. Somebody needs to forgive a parent. Somebody needs to go back and correct something they said. You started a nasty rumor that caused people money and opportunity. You're saying things in people's faces and saying other things behind their back. Let's, let's correct it this morning. This is a family. This is family. All families have issues. If you would, dig and you help me with one of those elements. Then you don't need to pull it open for me. I only have one hand. Amen. And the Bible says that on the night that our Lord was taken, that he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Take, eat, all of it. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice for your brokenness. We thank you, Lord, because your body was broken, our body can be healed. Because your life was broken, our lives can be repaired. As we take this element today, Lord, we respect and we bow and we appreciate you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's take it together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in the same way, he took the cup. And when he had given the cup to them, he said, this is my blood in the New Testament. The blood. The blood is reminiscent of the night when the Israelites escaped Egypt. And he put blood on the doorpost and when the death angel came through everywhere that he saw the blood he passed over I want you to take this communion cup and I want you to raise it over your head why are we doing this pastor because I want you to symbolically suggest that everything in my house is covered by the blood I want you to raise it over your head because everything you were and everything you used to be, hey, Toshanahaya, is covered by the blood. For somebody, the enemy wants to bring up your past, your issues, your problems, but God said it's covered by the blood. The devil wants to point a finger at you and say, you ain't worthy, you shouldn't be here, you know who you are, you know what you did, but look at somebody and say, I'm covered. 
by the blood. Lift it over your head. Father, we thank you today for the sacrifice made through Jesus. That everything that I was and everything that I did and everything that I was in a part of God, you have it covered by the blood. That the enemy can't bring up nothing that I did or said or used to be. So efficacious was your blood that it covered my past, my present, and my future. He told shot. For everything that I've done, everything I will do, Lord, you shed enough blood to cover it. You paid it all. And so, Lord, we thank you for the blood today in Jesus' name. Somebody shout, thank you for the blood. We will partake of it together. I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood. Oh, y'all know the song. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. What you say? Come on, one more time. I know it, I know it was. I know it was the blood. I know. Somebody help me celebrate. I know it. Come on, put those hands here. Let's have church. Oh. Stand to your feet real quickly. I got one verse, one verse I want to read in your hearing. I want to get into this word. Amen. My desire is not to keep you long. That's what preachers always say when they're going to preach long. <laughs> but it would be remiss of me in this brand new year to not bring you this message. Uh, thank you for being a mature church. Thank you for being a mature church that allowed me the opportunity to step away for a few weeks, to reconnect, to enjoy, to reflect. Amen. To spend time in God's presence, to spend time with my family. Amen. Amen. To refresh. Amen. Amen. To refresh and renew. And I thank God that we have a mature church that you could step out for a moment and get what you need and the whole thing not collapse. That people in place, that people in position, that people know what needs to be done. And so I just want to take a moment and celebrate all those volunteers. Amen. And staff and contractors. Come on, y'all. Help me praise God for them. Amen. Don't have to worry, walk the floor, or wonder what's happening because we have mature elders and ministers and deacons and people in place who want to say, see, see, see the old church, if the pastor wasn't there, people didn't come. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm so glad we have a church that understands that we have a purpose and we have a mission and that we have a mandate from God. And so we can hold things together. He don't have to be there for everything. Amen. Amen. One verse. Because in my private time with God, God has been dealing with me about this. And he wanted me to instruct this church and to lay a plumb line and direction for what we're going to be emphasizing all year. And so the theme for this year is going to be intentional living. Not emotional living. Intentional living. That this is going to be a year that you are going to live intentionally. That you are no longer going to walk accidentally into blessings. That this is going to be intentional. And so all year long, you're going to hear me hearing that theme flavored through my sermons, through my teachings, through my meetings with our staff about being intentional. This is a year of intentional living, intentional giving, intentional loving. Y'all not talking to me. That everything that, God, that we're going to do going forward is going to be intentional. Look at somebody and say it's going to be intentional. Yeah, it's, going, it's not emotional. Not emotional. 
This is going to be intentional. And so with that in mind, I want to begin this conversation that I'm going to be building on for the next several weeks uh, because I'm going to be dealing with each one of those things, our giving, our living, our loving, and show you how important it is that you have intention about what you do. Some of you live in such a way that you, you're like somebody who just pulls a bow and arrow and shoots it in the air and hope it hits something. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there and hope it, 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 it hits something. But, but God is dealing with me about this church being much more intentional. We're not just doing things to be doing it. We're not just doing it because other people do it. That everything we put our time, our effort, our energy, and our resources into is going to be done with the intention of being impactful or we won't do it at all. See, see, I'm going to get to the word. But see, the greatest thing that we have to wrestle with as a ministry is not between good and bad. It's between good, better, and best. That everything we do, some things are good, but they're not our best. That it might be a good idea, but it might not be a God idea. That it might be a great idea, but it's not the best idea. It doesn't have the greatest return on what we're trying to do. And so we have to have discernment to know what we should be doing versus what we shouldn't be doing and have enough faith in God to leave the things alone that we shouldn't be doing and put our energy and our focus into what we should be doing. Somebody say it's intentional. So look for me at Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4. One verse there because I see some of y'all got these heels on. Y'all ready to sit down already? Praise the Lord. <laughs> one verse, one verse. We're going to build this thought today. New King James Version says this, For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Please be seated. I'm going to be used for a simple subject this morning, the master builder. The master builder builder. Father, I yield today. I surrender. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. The master builder. A careful examination of the scriptures reveals clearly that God, God is a builder. In fact, he is a master builder. He ain't no upstart. He ain't no, uh, <laughs> you know, he's he not one of them kind of builders, you know, the, the little, little, little shade tree mechanic sort of thing. He's He's a master builder. You always see God building or rebuilding something in Scripture. From the beginning where God started with nothing and spoke the word and out of nothing came something. All the way to the book of Revelations where John said he saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of glory. God is either building or rebuilding something. He's either creating or recreating something. Let me tell you this, there is nothing in God's creation that was made haphazardly, accidentally, randomly, or by coincidence. Everything he did was deliberate. It's not where flowers popped up accidentally or trees came out accidentally or birds came up accidentally. God, everything you see in creation, all the way down to the ant, to the vastness of the universe, God did it on purpose. There is nothing in creation, invisible or visible, that God did not intentionally create. It was by divine design. Even, let me go here. Even when it comes to salvation, you think about salvation and God's plan for man, that the Bible talks about how Jesus was crucified by, this is one of my favorite terms, by the determinate counsel of God which means that none of it caught him by surprise. That when they took Jesus from judgment hall to judgment hall and they whipped him till he looked like a dog and they crucified him and threw him in a grave, as horrific, as terrible as it was, all of it was on purpose. That all of it was by God's design. So it wasn't where the devil was so strong or so strategic. It wasn't where the devil was so bad that he killed the Messiah. They couldn't have done it if God didn't allow it. Why am I saying that? Because you have to understand that if God allows something to happen in your life, God is always in control. 
There is nothing that happens, good or bad, that is not in God's control. That's why the Bible says that, that all things work together for the good to them who are called of the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. I want to make that clear to you because sometimes when you go through things, the enemy makes you think he is so strong or so powerful or so victorious that he got the jump on you, that he got the, he got the lead on you. But truth be told, if God allows something to happen in my life, it is by intention, it is by design, I I may not always understand it right now. I may not even agree with it, but God had a reason for it. And if God allows it to happen, there is a reason. That sometimes you will have to go on to know why you had to go through certain things. It's not where the devil is so strong, and it's not where a man is so strong. That's why I'm not afraid of man, because you couldn't kill me if God didn't allow it. It's not where you control my future. You might be my boss, but you don't control my future. You might be the president, but you don't control my destiny. There is nothing that you can do unless God allows it. That's what God, that's what the devil found out when it came to Job. That there were certain things the devil said, okay, you can touch his money. You can touch his family. You can touch his wealth. You can touch all that. But you can't touch his soul. Please understand that the devil does not have complete autonomy to do anything he wants in your life. Even the devil is, the God, is God's devil. That he can only, the only thing that can get to you are things that God allows. And if God allows it, God must be planning to get something out of it. Y'all not talking to me this morning. Look at somebody and say, it's intentional. It's not emotional. It's intentional. It's not where God gets up in the morning and says, I think I'm going to hit them with cancer. I think I'm going to cause a ruckus on the job. I think I'm going to have the kids show out. If God allows things to happen, God allows it for a reason. Sometimes it's for instruction. I'm trying to teach you something. Sometimes it's for correction. I'm trying to fix something. Sometimes it's for direction. That God allows things to break out over here to sometimes steer you in the right direction. That sometimes God makes relationships fall apart, though it break your heart. He is using it to guide you, to direct you, to move you to where you should be and move you away from where you shouldn't be. Look at some mind and say, it's intentional. Oh, my God. It is not emotional. It's not what God gets up in the morning and cracks his knuckles and says, I'm bored. Let me do something to live today because I just want to see you squirm. No, if God allows it, he intended for you to get something out of it. That's why we're instructed to praise God even in the midst of tragedy because I know that God is going to get the glory out of this. Somebody say that God's going to get the glory. I got to run. I got to run. Because God is a builder. He's a builder. He's creating something. He's doing something. And if God is a builder and God dwells in us, it's natural for us to want to build as well. That he created with us, within us the innate desire to build something. There's something in me that has to build. There's something in me that if I walk into an empty room, I got to fill it with furniture. Yeah, because that's how my father is. God stood on the edge of nothing and started creating everything. And so because God is in me, if I walk into an empty room, something in me wants to create something. There's something in me when there's dead, dry space of silence. There's something in me that wants to create music and life and livelihood because I can't stand empty spaces. I can't stand. If I walk up on an empty plot of land, something about me wants to put something on it, a house, a building, a store. I can't stand in front of empty things. I can't stand in front of voids and not want to build something on it. If I'm standing in front of a blank canvas, something in me makes me want to paint. Because there's something creative in me, and I got that from my Father. It is God's desire in us that we live our lives with, that we build something with our lives and build something of our lives. The problem is that many of us build based solely off of emotion and not intention. We throw things against the wall, hope they stick. We shoot an arrow in the air and hope it hits the target. And so we want to luck up and hit something. We want, we want to luck up. We want to, we want to live our lives like we're rolling the dice. See what happens today. Lucky seven. Hallelujah. We want to live by luck and not by faith. And here's the problem. We're all human beings. So, so for some, to some degree, you know, we're all emotional creatures. So to some degree, we have feelings. 
We have feelings about things, and we can't divorce ourselves from our feelings because we're human beings. God created us to be emotional be beings, and many decisions we make, if we're going to be honest, are emotional ones. From the people we marry, to the job we take, to the church we join, to the people we hang out with, then most of the time it's not really a well thought out decision. It was an emotional one. Y'all looking at me like y'all know what I'm talking about. If you'll be honest, some of the people you dated, let's be 100. It wasn't a thoughtful decision. It was an emotional decision. She was so cute, and he was so cute, and he was so fine, and she was so fine, and he had broad shoulders, and she had a nice body, and you made an emotional decision, eh, but you can look back now and say, it might not have been the smartest decision. Come on, somebody. And we do that all the time. When we join a church, we get happy. We run up to the altar. We had a great service. It was emotional. We can run into the altar, give up the right hand of fellowship, and say, I want to join your church. And then we don't see you till Easter. Thanksgiving. Something tragic happens in your life. Now I want to come to the church. But see, the truth be told, when you join an organization, it should be thoughtful. You gotta gotta run. And not just emotional. But but we can't divorce ourselves from our feelings, y'all. How many people know what I'm saying? You got feelings. You were created that way. But here's the problem: emotions can only take you so far. You can't build anything permanent or lasting on excitement alone. Some of us are emotional buyers. That's why our debt is so high. You know, we 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 spend money when we're sad. We spend money when we're mad. We spend money when we're celebrating. We spend, we, that's how we cope with life. I just got to spend money. Some of us are emotional eaters. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. When I'm mad, I eat. When I'm sad, I eat. When I'm depressed, I eat. When I'm excited, I eat. When I'm celebrating, I eat. I'm emotional about it. I'm not even hungry. This is the new year, y'all. And people make a lot of resolutions in the new year. They make the resolution to lose weight, save money. I'm going to start going to church, pastor. It's a new year. I'm going to make a resolution that every Sunday I'm going to be there. <laughs> it's new year. It's emotional. We're clinking glasses. We dance it. We're at the New Year's Eve service having a great old time, making all these promises and commitments but it's a proven fact that most people make resolutions, those resolutions are already broken within weeks of making them. Because the fact is, if you have no practice or discipline that supports that decision, then it won't last. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, if you're going to be a disciple, you have to have something called discipline. Discipline is a commitment to a practice or a training or a routine. It's not up and down. It's not in and out. Discipline says, I'm going to serve when I feel like it. I'm going to serve when I don't. Because of discipline. It's a discipline. It's something that I do. I don't check in with how I feel about it. It's just I made a commitment to do it, and I'm going to do it regardless of how I feel. I've trained myself to show up, whether I feel like it or not. Not only do I show up, I give my best whether I feel like it or not. The problem with the saints is that we're too fickle. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you got to leave father and mother and child and even deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He was talking to a crowd of people who were excited about miracles, who were excited about his healings. But when he turned around and said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, the Bible said that many of them failed to follow him anymore. Because they was into the emotion. When you make those resolutions, the emotions are there. It's just that the commitment is not there. Oh, the day I joined the church, I was so excited because he preached a great word. And I shook the pastor's hand and I met all the leadership and I had excitement. And we were glad to have you. The problem was you did not have commitment. <laughs> oh, God, I got to go. Discipline is not about emotion, it's about attention. Everything God did, he planned, he purposed, and he provided for. And next few moments, I want to talk about the planning, the purpose, and the provision. Y'all ready? 
Write this down, number one. Let's talk about the plan. Everything God did existed in God's mind before it came out of his mouth. That means that he didn't just open his mouth. See, I don't understand people talk about who act like God is sitting around just flapping his gap all the time. Just those people scared me. God talked to me and God told me and God said, what you having for breakfast this morning, Mary? Well, I'm going to have me some Cheerios. I don't believe those people because God don't do that. Because God knows the power of his words. And when God speaks something, something happens. When God speaks something, something moves, something changes, something is altered. And so people who sit around and talk like God just sit up and sit up and talk to you like we having coffee all the time and just run his mouth about stuff. I don't believe you. God is not like us. Some of us have the gift of gab. We sit up and talk about stuff we know and stuff we don't know. We just like running our mouths. Some of us just like to hear ourselves talk. You ever know those people? They don't even need you to be talking back. They can talk a whole hour to you, and you not even have a word in it because you just talk all the time. You just go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing without taking a breath. You can leave the house, come back with some groceries. They'll still be talking. <laughs> and y'all got this impression in your mind that God be sitting up in heaven just talking about stuff. But God is reserved in his speaking because he knows that when he talks, things happen. He knows that when he opens his mouth, something is about to happen. In the beginning, God said, and there was. If God ever speaks something in your life, just know that God is speaking to address something, to change something, to move something. And the, the, the issue, the problem with the church is that we've gotten so used to God talking that we don't be listening no more. So when we come to church and hear a man or woman of God speak, we've heard so many sermons and so much teaching and so much whatever, we can afford to go to sleep while the preacher preach. Because you don't understand that whenever God shoots, God don't shoot blanks. That when he shoots, he's going to hit something. He intended for you to hear it, and you might not need it now, and you might not need it tomorrow, but please put the message in your back pocket because at some point you're going to need it because God don't shoot blanks. If, he's, if you're in here this morning, God is aiming at you. He's aiming at something that's existing in your life, that has existed in your life, or will exist in your life. And you can play off the word like you want to, but the truth be mad, be told, you're going to need this word. Look at somebody and say, God, don't shoot blanks. Everything God did, he did it with a plan, which means to me that God is a planner. That there's a time to plan, and then there's a time to execute what you have planned. My issue with some people is that when you go off of excitement, you jump into things, you run after things, you go for things that you have no plan for. And if you have no plan for it, you can't sustain it. People come up with ideas all the time. What do you do around this church? We should do this, and we should do that, we should do the other. And the first thing I ask them is, do you have a plan for it? Do you have a budget for it? How many? How much? Who do you need? What day? What time? What commitment are we going to make to it? Because you can't just run out and have ideas if it's not sustained without a plan. Oh, my God. Same thing is true for your life. You can't just run after things and marry people and go for ideas and start ministries that have no plan. Write this down. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Oh, proper planning prevents poor for poor performance. This is what I believe. Most people who don't achieve their goals, it's not because they're bad people. It's because they're bad planners. Can I teach? It's not that you're a wicked person or a bad person or a weak person. It's just that when you decided to build it, to go out there and do it, you didn't plan for it. You just got excited and went and did it. In one place, Jesus said, no man builds a tower without first counting the cost. And some people will run after an idea or run out to do something you have not planned for, meaning you have not put aside no budget for it. You have not figured out what it's going to cost. You have not figured out what staff is going to be needed. You have not figured out how to sustain it. You have not even thought about how this is going to impact or change your life to make this commitment. You just did it. And because you have proper, you improper planning, you have poor results. 
poor results. You're making bad relationship decisions. You're making bad decisions with your money. You're making bad decisions with the things that you've gotten involved in. We've wasted money. We've wasted time. We've wasted opportunity, not because you're a bad person, but because you are a poor planner. God told me to meet with this church at every department in this, in this church. We're going to be having a meeting to have planning. Most people wait for January the 1st and shoot. But God said January is going to be a time for you to plan, and then you will shoot. Ooh, I'm talking up in here. That we're going to be intentional. That January is not the time to run out there. And just dress. Let's go do it. Let's just run out there. Let's get excited. It's January 1. we got to do it. No, God said this is the time to sit down and plan it. This is the time for you to huddle with your teams, your partners, your departments, and your family. Huddle and hammer out what is the plan. Does anybody hear what I'm saying in here? That this is the time to sit down with your family and plan what this year will look like or the next five years will look like. This is not the time to shoot. The issue, see, the problem is a lot of people shoot, but they ain't got no plan. So by March, nothing gets done. Nothing is executed. Nothing has changed. And 2024 looks exactly like 2023 because you did not plan. Oh, my God. You should be answering questions. What are you trying to accomplish? Are you clear about the task that's given to you? When you understand the vision, you don't get stuck on the players. Because the players may change, but the game does not. And some people who are not attached to, tied into, or clear about what the vision is, they get moved around and get befuddled and get in an attitude when the players change. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Adrian. I got one amen. And because you are tied into personalities and not vision, every time a personality is moved around, then you get thrown off because you never understood what the vision was. What are we trying to create? What are we trying to accomplish? Everything we do, we do according to a plan. It's not personal. It's intentional. <laughs> Anybody get anything out of this? You have to understand. People are like people. People coming into and out of your life are like people on a bus. They come and they go. They get on and they get off. But just like a bus, though people get on and people get off, the destination doesn't change. The destination is the destination. For somebody, I got on the bus about two miles in. For somebody, I got on the bus three miles in. For somebody, you got off the bus early. Somebody, you got off the bus late. doesn't matter when you get on or get off. The destination of the bus doesn't change. So I'm adjuring some of you who have a tendency to be emotional to start becoming more intentional and begin to ask your leader, the head of your house, the head of your department, what is the vision? What was the big picture? What are we trying to create as a team, as a ministry? You guys are the heads of your family. Whether you are female or male, you need to meet with who on your team. If you're a single mother, meet with your kids. If you're a father, meet with the whole family. Meet with your people and say, what is the vision? So that everything that comes up lines up with the vision and not how you feel that day. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. If you're going to base everything you're going to do on how you feel that day, sometimes I feel really good and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I feel like doing it and then sometimes I don't. But what we need is a little word called consistency. Look at somebody say, you got to be consistent. Second thing I want to say is this. I want to say this. Write this down. I want to talk to you about the purpose. There is nothing God created without a purpose. Nothing. There is nothing that exists in the universe that God did not have a plan for. If he created it, there's a reason for it. Even if you don't understand it, even if you don't agree with it, when God begins to move or use certain people or raise certain people or put down certain people, he did it with a purpose in mind. This is where I want your life to go. The Bible says this in Proverbs 16 and 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his paths. 
In Proverbs 3 and 6, it says this, that in all your ways, acknowledge him and that he will make your path straight. What am I saying? There has to be a cooperation between what you are doing and what God has intention. The issue is you want to do things with your life without checking in with God first. That God already has a plan that's blessed. And instead you try to come up with the plan, you need to tie into what does God has planned for your life. The way you do it is you jump out and do something and you want God to bless it. Now you're standing over there on the side of the road talking about God bless this mess. You married them. You dated them. You took that job. You took that, that opportunity. You took that position. You didn't even consult God. And God says, I want to be consulted on the front end and not the back end. Acknowledge me, respect me, consult me in all your ways, and then I will direct your paths. How many things have we gotten into where we got ourselves into a mess because you never consulted God in the first place? Now you tied up in something, married to something, committed to something, and made yourself a part of something that you now regret because you did not consult God first. And God says, I want you to have enough respect for me that before you take the job, you ask me. Before you take the position, you ask me. Not you ask them, you ask me. You came aside and you talked and said, God, should I buy this? Should I go here? Should I move here? Should I go there? Should I sign this contract? Because I want God to know he is the head of my life. That there is no decision I'm going to make without first asking him. Without first consulting him. I have made a lot of bad decisions. I'll be honest, I made a lot of bad decisions. I've put people in place I didn't ask God about. I've had people in my life, Leah, that I didn't ask God about. Who is this person? Should they be here? Should I allow them to be close or allow them to stay away from me? And because I didn't ask the question, I had to deal with the consequences, not because God didn't tell me. I didn't even ask him. Y'all ain't saying anything. I'm going to be stepping on some toes on today. Check in with God first to make sure, here it is, that you are in sync. Yeah. That you are in sync with him. Just because you're moving don't mean you're in sync with God. Just because you, they used to have what they call busy work. Anybody know what busy work is? Yeah, on your job. I used to work in fast food, and they had busy work. So, you know, uh, uh, when it wasn't so busy and there wasn't so many crowds there, we had to look like we was doing something just to keep the boss satisfied. So you'd be back there rubbing stuff down, moving boxes from this side to that side because you're trying to convince the boss that you're busy. It was busy work. You just wanted to be doing something. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of us are in church. We're doing busy work. You ain't getting no soul saved. You ain't changing your lives. You ain't have no impact. You're just doing something to be doing it. But God said this year you got to be more intentional. There has to be an ROI, a return on investment, that when you do something, there is a return that you expect on it. Because when God created something, he expected something to happen. You're not going to talk to me. How are you measuring success? Success is not always measured by money. I hate to tell you. Sometimes success is not about money. Sometimes it's about impact. But the question to me, Charlene, is how are you quantifying the impact that you have? People be bragging about, oh, we, we, we did so many million dollars worth of whatever. We had so many so-and-so. So how are you quantifying that? Are you just making up numbers? I get on people's nerves around here because I want numbers. How many people came? How many people joined? How many guests we have? How many visitors? How much money? What did we spend? How many people came? How many, how many people volunteered? How many people not? You know why? Because sometimes we make up numbers that are not true. And you brag about things that are not real. And you have no real way of quantifying your success. You can't go back from last year and determine from this year to last year how much you've made or how much you've gained or how far you've gone because you have no system for quantifying it. I walk in and say, well, how was your meeting? It was amazing. It was awesome. How are you quantifying that? Awesome based on what? Awesome compared to what? 
That's why looking at your family budget is important. That's why sitting down and going over your bills is important. That's why looking at where you were last year versus this year is important. I know this is boring stuff, but if we're going to move forward, we got to be people who use our heads and not just our emotions. Oh, God. Can, can, can I go further? What are your expected outcomes? If you come to me with an idea, my next question is, what do you expect to come out of this? Is this going to raise money? Is this going to save souls? Is this going to change lives? Is it going to increase awareness? There needs to be something that says, this is what I'm hoping to achieve, or else how do you know that you're successful? It's not luck. It's intention. I'm going to throw this in here while I'm talking to you. You, this is this. you may have to retool for a different problem. You know what I mean by retool? Sometimes in those uh, uh, car plants, they will shut down for so many months. They'll shut the whole plant down, and they'll bring in new tools for the new kind of car they're about to create. And so while they're shutting down, it's a shutdown to you, but what they're actually doing is setting up the room so that you can have new tools to create a new kind of car. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brother James. Because sometimes you're trying to solve a new problem with old tools. The reason why we're not shouting right now is because you're listening, because God is trying to retool your mind. You're trying to deal with a new school devil with old school tools. And wonder why it's not working. You're trying to go back and use something that worked in 1995, and here it is, 2024, and it's not working. So what God has to do is pull you aside so he can rule, retool your thinking. There's nothing wrong with you. The problem is not that big. It's just that you are not approaching it with new tools. I was fixing something at the house, and I got ready to use the tools I had and realized that they had a different kind of screw in it. And no matter what I did, it was not going anywhere because I had to use a different kind of tool to deal with this kind of instrument. Y'all, come on, y'all. You're going to have to retool. you have to rethink. See, here's the problem. I heard somebody say this. If you're used to handling everything like a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. <laughs> if you're used to handling everything like a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. So you measuring with a hammer, <laughs> you're sawing with a hammer, amen. You're trying to do all these things that a hammer wasn't created to do. My question to you is, do you have any other tools in your toolbox? This is the year that God says, I'm gonna put more tools in your toolbox. There's nothing wrong with the tool you have, but for the things I'm going to do in your life, I'm going to have to expand your exposure. I'm going to give you new tools so you can go to a new level. Everybody's always shouting about, let's go to a new level, a new level, a new level. But you ain't got the tools to live on that level. Come on and talk to me. You ain't got the tools to live in the rooms that you're trying to live in. You ain't got the equipment to be there. And if you get there, you can't stay there. But God said, you give me your attention for a minute, I'm going to put some new tools in your toolbox. When I put these tools in your toolbox, no, I can't use the hammer. No, this is a job for a saw. I'm going to pull my saw out. Somebody's going to have to go back to school. Somebody's got to do some more training. Somebody's got to go to a leadership conference somewhere. Somebody's got to add some more books to your library. Why you only got the same books you had from 1972 when the world around you has changed? You may have to relearn some stuff. You may have to rethink some stuff. You may have to go look at it differently and stop saying that's what we did back in the day. This is a new day. You need some new tools for a new devil. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, retool my mind. Retool my mind. I may not be able to react the same way. I, let me tell you a real true, true fact happened to me, Brother Lee. I had a plant in my house. I loved the plant. It was a gorgeous plant. I fed it. I gave it water. I gave it fertilizer. But it kept dying. I put more water in it. Water dripping all out the pan. It was still dying. What I had to do was move the plant to a window where it could get some sunlight. Because it wasn't just that it needed water, it needed sunlight. 
So I had to move it from where it was. I liked where it was. It looked cute where it was. It fit the decor where it was, but it was getting no light where it was. So I had to move it from that spot to somewhere else. When I moved it to a spot that it could get more light, it began to flourish. Some of you, God said, I'm going to move you from where you were. Y'all want to shout, but y'all don't want to list it. God said, I'm going to move you. I'm going to move some people around you. I'm going to move some things around the room because I'm trying to position you where you could flourish. Look at somebody say, God wants you to flourish. It's not that you haven't done good. It's that you could do better. It's not that it's not cute, but if I take you from over here and put you over here, you're going to be surprised how much you will flourish. I didn't do anything different, but exposed it to light. I am notorious for changing things around here. I am notorious. I'm like that at home, too. I'll move a couch over there and step back and look at it and say, mm, that's not working. So I'll push it over here. And I say, uh, that's not working either. Then I push it over. You know why? I'm trying to make sure that it's put in a place that it gets the maximum impact. The only thing that's certain in life is change. We're not doing things arbitrarily. We're not doing things because we're bored. We're doing things because we have a plan. We have a vision. We have a purpose. We have a design. We have a mandate. And everything you see moving around is so that we can put it in alignment with what God has called for. Are you moving your life in a way that God has called for or are you stuck on stupid? I said what I said. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So no wonder you're bored in church. You've been giving the same praise since 1980. <laughs> the same praise, the same dance, the same way, the same side of the room. Some of you, your life will change if you just move from one side of the room to the other. You'll be surprised. I always sit in this chair on this side, in this corner. If you just moved the three feet over and sat somewhere else, you'd be surprised what your worship experience would look like. Oh, I'm stepping on toes. Some of you are going to have to change your circle of friends. I know that's your comfort zone. I know that's the folk you roll with, you rock with, you down with. But have you considered that the reason your life can't go no higher is because you're running with people who think too low? That birds of a feather do flock together. And if you hanging out with chickens, you can't fly like an eagle. Is it possible that God is trying to pull you away from the chickens you hanging out with? So that I can expose you to what I shall. Eye has not seen, thank you, Lord. Ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You can't see it because you still want to hang around with the same people. Let me tell you, everybody can't go. Everybody can't go. I love you. I appreciate you. You've been my dog. I'm going to still be down with you. But there are some places that you just can't go. This is the year I'm letting people go. They can't go. You can't get nothing harm, no harm against you. I'm not mad at you. I still love you. I'm going to pray for you. But if you can't go, you just can't go. Look at somebody and say, let it go. Last thing I'm going to talk about is provision. I'm, like, oh, I'm doing good. Thank you, Jesus. Everything, listen, number three, provision. Everything God called for, he provided for. Before he created fish, he created an ocean. Before he created a man, he created a garden. Before he created birds, he created the airspace for them to dwell in. That while God was talking, God wasn't just talking about having it, God was talking about sustainability. And the reason why I'm having this conversation with you in the first Sunday in this year is because God told me to talk to you about sustainability. That it's not just getting it, it's about keeping it. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not just somebody said, oh, my God, in 2024, I'm going to get married. I shot back. That ain't the point. The point is staying married. <laughs> I'm going to start a ministry. That's great. God bless you. But are you going to stay with the ministry? Oh, I'm going to go out here and start me a business. That's great. 
But are you planning to, how are you planning to sustain everything you birth, you got to feed? You hear what I'm saying? You can birth great ideas, but everything you birth, you have to feed it. Come on, my mothers and here, my fathers. You can't just pop out a baby. You got to feed the baby. I should have said pop out. That's probably a bad analogy to use. That's just not, I don't, I don't disrespect nobody. But I'm saying that people brag about having a baby. I'm not worried about having them. I'm, I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to feed them. Them jokers grow. They grow. They get tall. Feet get long. <laughs> they eat up in the summertime vacation. They eat you out of house and home. It's not just about having them. It's about sustaining them. God said for somebody, this is the year of sustainability. This is the last time you're going to have stuff and lose stuff. You're not going to keep birthing dreams that, come to, that don't come to pass. You're not going to keep starting ideas that never flourish. God said, I'm, you, got, you got some things that you need to go back and polish off. They were God ideas. They were good ideas. You left it on the shelf. You put it in the closet. Some of y'all earned degrees that you don't even use. Because this is not just about getting it. The question is what you're going to do with it. How are you going to sustain it? How are you going to take care of it? How are you going to keep up with it? God didn't do anything without, first of all, thinking about, okay, if I'm going to make fish, I'm going to have to put some water in there. You follow what I'm saying? He's such a planner that he said, okay, I'm, I'm, going, I'm, going, to move, I'm going to move the mountains over here. Yeah. And I'm going to move the desert over here. And I'm going to put the valley over here. And I'm going to put the ocean over here. God was already setting up the room. For the plan that he had. How much time are you putting in to setting up the room? Some of you are gifted people. You're talented people. You're smart people. You're loving people. But you don't plan to sustain it. You don't plan to keep it. You don't plan to keep it going. And God wants to tell you that. Let me tell you this. Before you get provision, you first of all have to have a vision. I got to go. I got to go. Before God releases provision. See, whenever I jump up in the offering and say, God's going to get provision, you get excited. But before there is provision, you have to have a vision. Are you hearing me? I'm here. Some of you got the cart before the horse. You're saying, God, bless me, increase me, give me more money, give me more resource, give me more money, give me more favor. And God's saying, for what? For what? Give you a million dollars for what? <laughs> Give you more opportunity for what? You don't have a vision for your life. You don't have a vision for your ministry. You have no vision for your calling. You have no vision. I'm not asking you this year, do you have enough money? I'm asking you, do you have enough vision? I'm asking you, what do you see? What do you see, Abraham? Come up on top of this mountain and turn around east and west and north and south. And everything I see, everything you see, I'll give it to you. My question to you is what do you see? Do you see yourself living better? Do you see yourself in a loving relationship? Do you see yourself as a successful entrepreneur? Do you see yourself finishing that degree? Do you see yourself living in a better neighborhood? Do you see yourself living without that sin in your life? Do you see yourself walking in victory and walking in praise? You can't have it if you can't see it. I'm not asking you, do you have it? I'm not asking you, are you there yet? I'm asking you, do you at least see it? Look at somebody and say, I see this thing. 
I see this day. I see it so clearly. I'm walking around in the middle of the night and I'm dreaming about it. I'm walking around about it. I'm talking about it. I'm testifying about it. I'm getting on people's nerves about it. I'm so enthralled with the vision that God has given me. Every time you see me coming, you hear me talking about the vision. God's going to raise me. God's going to bless me. God's going to move some things in my life. It's getting on my nerves. Keep on talking about it. Keep on speaking about it. Get on people's nerves about it because after a while, the thing that you've been talking about is going to come to pass because I already saw it. Slap about three people and say, I see it. I see it. I see it. As long as you see yourself always being a beggar, you're going to be a beggar. I see myself at the head and not the tail. I see myself above and not beneath. It might be bad now, but it's not going to always be this way. I don't have two nickels to put together, but it's not going to always be this way. I rock myself to sleep at night, but it's not going to always be this way. I'm broke, busted, and disgusted, and sometimes I'm defeated, but it's not going to always be this way. Somebody jump on your feet and say, it's not going to always be this way. Stop about three people and say, it's not going to always be this way. Move around and find somebody and say, it's not going to always. I'm not going to always be this way. I'm not going to always be broke. I'm not going to always be the last one. I'm not going to always be borrowing money. I'm going to be a lender and not a borrower. I'm not going to always be in this hospital room. I'm going to walk out of here one day. I'm not going to always have this medicine. I'm going to get this blood sugar under control. I'm going to get this blood pressure under control. I'm not going to always be tired. I'm going to have me some favor. I'm not going to always be lonely. I'm going to have somebody help me. Somebody say, God's going to change it. doesn't call for anything that he doesn't pay for. If God calls for anything in your life, God has already provided for it. You worried about money, you should be worried about vision. Because if God puts it in you to do it, you may not know where it's coming from, you don't know who's going to give it, you don't know where the help's going to come from, but if God puts down in your spirit. God said, I've already checked my coffer. I've already checked my bank account. I've already checked with my resources and I've already determined that I have enough to complete the job that I have called for. He which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The moment he called you, he already counted up the cost and said, I Y'all ain't excited about this. That devil keeps trying to tell you that they're going to take the car. They're going to take the house. They're going to shut down the building. They're going to take down the business. But God said to tell you, if I called for it, I'm enough God to pay for it. If I call for it in your life, I'm enough God to pay for whatever it is that you need. Whatever it is I put in your spirit. Only thing I need you to do is just believe me for it. I don't need you to do anything to believe me. Position yourself. Act like you're going to be somebody. Walk like you're going to be somebody. Dress like you're going to be somebody. Start paying attention like you're going to be somebody. Lift your hands right here and say, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. God has been speaking to some of you about your future, about your life, about your family, and you're too big for you to even receive. You can't even hardly believe it. But God said, lift your hand and say, I receive it. Yeah, I'm going to take this first Sunday, and I'm going to thank God for everything he's about to do in my life. You're not helping me in here. I'm going to give God glory for everything. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. It may not come to and it may not come tomorrow and it may not come next week but God wouldn't have put it in me if it wasn't for me do you hear what I'm saying the fact that I believe it the fact that I can see it means I have faith for it Ooh, that's the sign God wouldn't have put it in you if it wasn't for you you can't judge where you are to determine where you shall be. But if you're going to get there, it's got to be intentional. 
can't be emotional. Let me close with this. Years ago, you can keep on playing. Years ago, they had uh, like a safety on, on new cars. They put a safety message, a security message on your window. So when you drive your car, either on your right window or, or mirror or your passenger, your driver's mirror, there'd be a little message. You could barely see it sometimes. And the message would say that objects may be closer than they appear. That sometimes your optics may be off, your vision may be skewed. And some of y'all been waiting for a long time for something to happen, but God said, don't quit because objects in your mirror are closer. Y'all wanna play around, y'all don't wanna have church. Y'all don't wanna really have church. For somebody you've been waiting for a long time, you waited through 2021, you waited through 2022, you waited through 2023 and nothing happened and you're ready to quit the church and you're ready to walk away from the ministry and you're ready to walk away from your marriage and you're ready to walk away from the business. But God told me to tell you at the beginning of this year that objects are closer than they appear. And if you don't give up, if you don't walk away, you're almost there that is closer than you think that is closer than you believe somebody shout it's closer it's closer it's closer it's closer your friends don't see it but it's closer your family don't believe it but it's closer your enemies don't want you to have it but it's closer I'm one step closer somebody take a step somebody take a step start walking. Just start walking. Every step you take, God, you're getting closer to it. You've got obstacles in your way, but I'm getting closer. They said you wouldn't make it, but it's getting closer. They said you wouldn't come out of it, but I'm getting closer. I cried, but I'm getting closer. I fell, but I'm getting closer. I've been tired, but I'm getting closer. Don't You're closer than you think. You're closer to it than you thought. You're closer to it than you believe. You're closer to it. Slap somebody say, I'm closer than I thought. I'm closer than I thought. I'm so close, Leah. Now I can smell it. I'm so close, Adrian. Now I can touch it almost. I'm so close, Connie, that now I can feel the heat from it. I'm so close. That's why the devil's fighting you. That's why the enemy's trying to get you to give up. That's why he's trying to make you quit. Because I'm close. You about to see everything you've been praying for. You about to see everything you've been crying for. You about to understand why you cried so much. You about to understand. I'm too close to quit now. I'm too close to quit now. I was about to walk away from the ministry, but I'm too close to quit now. I was about to walk out on my opportunity, but I'm too close. Somebody say, Somebody so close, if I just push on you, you're going to fall into it. Push on somebody right now and say, you do.
Clap your hands and give God praise all over this building. Everybody that believes it's in your hands, give God praise right here. Everybody that believes that God is building something, give it praise right here. I'm working on something. I'm working on something. I'm working on something. Listen, some of y'all, some of y'all been in a fight, I know it. Because I can feel it. But do you not know that the only reason why the enemy's fighting you is because you have something worth stealing? The Bible said that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You don't see nobody breaking in no house that ain't got nothing. Thieves and robbers only show up at places that got something. And so if you find yourself under attack and you find yourself in a fight, just know it's a sign that you must have something already that the enemy doesn't want you to possess. But the worship team already told you, I got it. Lift your hands all over this building. I'm praying for each of you that this be the year that you make some solid decisions. That you be intentional about your decisions. Because God wants to release in your life. He wants it to be sustainable. What, what glory does it give God for you to have something if you can't keep it? This year you're going to hold on to it, Brother Moore. God is strengthening your hands. While you're lifting them, God is strengthening your hands right now to keep whatever he's going to put in your hands. Here, Tosha Maha, strengthen my hands. Yeah, whatever money you put in my hand, let me keep it. Hallelujah. Help me raise these kids. Help me keep this marriage together. Strengthen my hands. Help me keep this opportunity. Some of you are walk into doors and you're going to, you're intimidated by the size of the door. But God said, I wouldn't have opened the door if I couldn't keep you in the door. Oh my God, I feel God in this place. If you're in this room today, this is your first Sunday here. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not a believer and everything I'm talking to you about is going straight over your head. The first thing you need to discuss is your relationship with God. And so if you're in here and you're a backslider, this is the first Sunday of the year. This would be a great time to rededicate your life back to God. And for some of you, you don't have a good church home. You kind of floating around from here to there. You shop in churches like you shop for shoes. And sometimes the greatest things that God has for you don't make no sense on the outside. It's just the knowing on the inside that this is my place. This is where I'm supposed to be. And so if you're in one of those categories, whether you are rededicating your life to Jesus or giving your life to Jesus for the first time or you just need a good church home, I want you to come to my left. Come to my life. And our ministers are prepared to receive you. Come to my left. They're prepared to receive you. Maybe my life has been off, off course. It's been off kilter. And I need that little push, a little extra something to help me go to the next level. If you're here and you need prayer, my prayer words are on the altar right now, prepared to have prayer with you. If that's you, just make your way to this altar. Say, preacher, pray for me. I, I, need, I need you to do something in my life. For somebody, you're answering the call of God on your life. You're not going to wrestle no more this year. I'm going to get my life right. I'm going to get my life right. I may not be all the way there, but I'm going to get my life right. I'm going to be a more dedicated volunteer. I'm going to be a more faithful member. I'm going to be a more consistent husband or consistent wife. I got to get my life right. If that's you, come. If that's you, come. Come on, praise him.
Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. We're about to dismiss. Stand to your feet all over the building. If you still need church membership or if you need salvation, come to my left. Our ministers are prepared to serve with you. Would you take somebody's hand next to you on your left and your right? Let's join hands all this building as a family. None of us are free until all of us are free. It's important that all of us come out, that all of us are victorious. I want you to squeeze the hand next to you. Prophesy to them, you're coming out of it, whatever it is. Whatever, you, whatever it is, whatever, you're coming out of it. Just prophesy to them. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a bad attitude. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe you're out of love or maybe you're in between relationships. I don't know. Maybe your kids are acting crazy and you don't know what to do with yourself, but look at them and just prophesy to them. You're going to come out of this. You're going to come out of this. You're going to, God, God has intentions to bring you out of this. God has intentions to get you through this. God has intentions to to make you victorious. I'm breaking change today. I'm leaving attitudes at the altar. I'm leaving issues at the altar. I'm letting things go. I'm coming out of it right now. It's poisoning my spirit. It's messing up my plans. It's ruining my vision. But God said I'm going to open your eye. If you let it go, I'm going to do something. Jesus, take the wheel. Take the wheel. Take control. I give it up to you. I give control of my life to you. I give up my plans for yours. I give up what I want to do for what you want me to do. I'm surrendering today. In the name of Jesus, we leave this place, God. Give us vision. Give us plan. Give us provision. Lead us, guide us, direct us. God, our steps. We yield, we surrender, we submit to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you hug as many people as you can on your way out the door? Encourage somebody. Strengthen somebody. Lift somebody. Hallelujah.